to our static website hosting with AWS Workshop. Uh, my name is Ansh. I am the Corporate Director for Freetail. If you haven't already met me, and Tristy here is one of my faithful team members. Um, and we're trying a new different format for this workshop. So as you can probably tell, you're watching on YouTube live. Uh, so the idea is you will simply type your questions into the live chat, should you have any, and Tristy will act as an intermediary between the YouTube live stream and the Zoom call through which I am hosting this workshop. Um, so she will ask me any questions on your behalf. Um, and then we will, of course, as usual, have this available for everybody to see after the fact on YouTube. Um, and it should be a lot quicker this time because apparently we just upload the video. Uh, with that in mind, one last thing. Uh, I've been told I talk a little fast and I go a little fast in some of my workshops, especially when I get nervous. Uh, so I will try to go as slow as possible, but please, please, please feel free to ask any questions to Tristy and I will happily stop and explain any concepts that I may have glossed over. Uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and start. Uh, so this workshop is about website hosting uh, in AWS. Uh, so really quickly, all I'm gonna do is go over what that means. Uh, and then after that, I'll show you basically how you can host your own website with AWS. Uh, so the first thing to note is that today, I'm only going to show you how to host static websites. Uh, now you've seen plenty of websites. You've seen Google, Amazon. Most of those websites are what we call dynamic because they require this website to have some sort of server side language or connection. Usually it's a website interacting with a database. For example, Google's like search engine database of all the websites that they index or Amazon's database of all the products they might offer you. Uh, but some of the websites uh, don't actually require any sort of database access. You know, They're just there so that you can see uh, what information they want you to see on the web page. A good example of this might be somebody's personal portfolio or professional portfolio, uh, just so they can post their work on the web in a format that most people can view it just by typing in a URL. And that is what we call a static website. Uh, so today I'm just gonna show you how to host static websites, meaning it's just HTML, CSS, maybe some JavaScript, uh, but uh, no server side interactions of any sort, just the type of website that you will use to display information for somebody else. And what are we going to be doing that with? We are gonna be using AWS, uh, which is short for Amazon Web Services. Services. Uh, if you haven't already heard about it, it is a huge cloud provider. And what they do is they provide a bunch of services for us to use. And then of course they charge us for it. Uh, but incidentally, the two services we'll be talking about today are actually for the most part free unless a bunch of bunch of people visit your website. Uh, so the first big one is called Simple Storage Service or S3, uh, which basically allows you, it's kind of like a Google Drive for AWS. Well, you get to upload your own documents and then it'll give you a publicly accessible link so that you can simply view those documents online, assuming you have configured it correctly, which is what I'm going to show you today. Uh, and then the second service is Route 53. Uh, Route 53 is AWS's service for DNS or domain name server registration. Uh, and we're going to be using that just to give ourselves a custom URL so that we don't have to give the nasty URL that AWS provides us. We can just use our own custom URL that we have bought through our own third party provider. Uh, and that is it. So with that, let's go into some code stuff. Uh, I'm going to assume you have uh, the very, very most basic knowledge of how HTML works. And we're going to start completely from scratch. So let's go ahead and open a new folder. Uh, I'm going to make a completely new folder. Alrighty, as you can see, this folder is completely empty. Uh, and the only really important file that we want to have is an uh, HTML file. And usually that's called index.html. Um, if you want some more information about how to make some cooler web pages, check out my other workshop, which is available on YouTube called Beginners Web Development One. Uh, but anyway, I'm just going to write a really quick HTML file. Uh, this part is not really important. The important part is going to be, you know, uh, actually hosting it. Uh, let's just say there. And then let's call it a page. So again, the HTML here is not actually very important, um, but really quickly, let's go ahead and pull up the page. Um, and the way you pull up the page, you have to, you go to a browser, uh, any browser will do, and you simply type in the, the entire path for your document. So right here, this is the complete path all the way down to my index.html file, and it should pop up and just show whatever your HTML is. Uh, as you can see, the title is test web page, and we have the content right here. So it is certainly the file that we have defined. Uh, now we're going to go into how to host this. 
So first thing we're going to do, we are going to go to the AWS console and log in. Now, if it's your first time using AWS, it might be a little more complicated than that. You'll actually have to create an account. Um, is if you're a student, you might have to supply some student information so that you can get free credits with AWS Educate. Um, but yeah, so you, you'll create an account and everything, but once you've created your account and all that, you will be given access to the console, which looks like this. Uh, and as you can see, AWS provides a bunch of bunch of services for all sorts of different things. Um, we will not need to know about all of these. I myself only know like, you know, five or six very well. Uh, but the one we are going to look at is S3. So simply type in S3 to the search bar and we pop up with AWS S3. Uh, again, this is just like a Google Drive, except for AWS. So you can imagine all of these, S3 calls them buckets, but they're really just folders. Uh, they're the same way that Google Drive might have folders. Um, so we're going to create a new bucket uh, and we have to enter a DNS compliant bucket name, meaning a bucket name that could be used within a URL. Um, so I will just do summer hacks workshop. Cool. Um, let's really quick hit next. Uh, there's going to be a lot of settings here that you can configure for various AWS stuff. Um, no need to worry about that. We'll just go with the default settings. Uh, this one, this one is actually very important. So by default, buckets in S3 are meant to be used for private data, meaning that nobody should be able to access them but you. But that's not what we want for a website, right? We want a website to be able to be accessed by anyone on the web who's actually looking for it. So we are going to uncheck block all public access, meaning that the bucket will be accessible publicly, assuming we don't check any of these boxes. Um, AWS is going to tell you like, oh, this is very dangerous. All your data is going to be public. But if you want your data to be public, it's really not that big a deal. Uh, so simply say, I acknowledge that what I'm doing is quote unquote dangerous. It'll ask you to review your settings and then go ahead and create your bucket. And just like that, your bucket has been created. Um, and then you can go ahead and upload the file that you have made to your bucket. So I believe this is the right, yeah, this is the right. This is the file we just created. Uh, again, just like Google Drive, you know, just upload the file the same way you would, and it's right there. Uh, if we can try accessing it now, well, when we click on the file, we're getting, we're given an object URL. However, we are given, given this error code uh, saying access denied. Uh, meaning that there's a little more work that we have to do in order to actually make the, public, the bucket publicly accessible to everyone on the web. Uh, so let's go back and do that. Uh, we want to go to properties first. Uh, AWS actually has, oh, excuse me, we're in the object right now. We have to go to actually all the way to the top level of the bucket, then go to properties. And AWS actually has a setting here for buckets that allows you to host static websites. So we're going to go ahead and enable that. Now it'll ask you for an index and error document. Uh, neither of these is technically required, but it's always good to have an index document, which basically tells it, okay, when somebody types in the URL, where does it go by default? Uh, we named our file index.html. So we're going to type index.html here. Cool, uh, moving on. We also have to do some stuff in permissions. Uh, block public access. Uh, this was the checkmark stuff from earlier. Uh, if you fail to do the checkmark stuff, you can manually turn everything off right here. Uh, but it should be good uh, if you just did it as I did. Uh, next, you go to access control list here. Uh, this is public access, right? So here's what you define what everybody who has access to the bucket can do. Right now, if you notice all of these hyphens, it means that not everyone has any of these permissions, meaning they can list objects, write objects, read bucket permissions, write bucket permissions. None of them can do that. Uh, so really quickly, all we're going to do is we're going to give them permission to list the objects, meaning we're going to give them permission to see what is inside our bucket, which is exactly what we want. We want them to be able to see our website. Boom. And the last thing we need to change, I believe, is the bucket policy. Um, this is a bit complicated, um, but I have actually, if you go to our starting guide, this is the ultimate hackathon start. What the hell is this? Remind me later. All right, if you go to our ultimate hackathon starting guide, uh, link will be in the description below. Uh, and then also Shristi or Ellen, if one of you could put the link in the live stream, that would actually be fantastic. Um, there is a section on cloud that I wrote and I have also included an S3 example bucket policy. Uh, so all you gotta do is open that. Uh, and then all you have, you have your entire policy right here. All you gotta do is copy and paste it to the bucket policy here and replace bucket name here 
with your bucket name. You also need to include this slash and star, uh, which I will go ahead and include in the bucket policy after this, so that all you have to do is replace it with your bucket name. So once you save that, that work? There we go. Perfect, perfect. Uh, if you did everything correctly, then there should be three public tags, one under permissions, one under the access control list, and one under the bucket policy. Uh, but what that means is that if you go back to our bucket, pull up our file, use the link, and there you go. So now, uh, if you want, you can you know test this, on, test this out on your own computer. Simply type in this link, which is always going to be the bucket name followed by at s3.amazonaws.com slash the index document, it will just put you right here. And because we defined index earlier, we also probably don't need this end part. Nope, that was a lie. All right. Well, it looks like we need the end part. That's okay. No big deal. Hey, Anj, uh, really quick, we have a question. Is sure. the bucket policy only required for CLI access? For what access? CLI access. Uh, uh, what is the word before access? I can't. CLI. I can't. So, is the bucket policy only required for CLI access, CLI access? Oh, CLI access. Um, no, no. Uh, I think I believe it's required regardless. Uh, and if, if you don't understand that question, CLI refers to the command line interface for AWS. Um, so the question was asking if the bucket policy is only required if you want to use the CLI in order to. Uh, uh, change the settings, and I believe the answer is no. Um, yeah, are there any other questions? Okay, cool, moving on. Uh, so that's the first part. Really, we, we are basically done, in a sense. Uh, we made a website file, of course, a very, very basic and very bad looking website file, but we now we have uploaded it on the web, and anyone should be able to just pull it up on their computer and see it. Um, so that's pretty much it, except uh, the one thing that annoys us is that this link is absurdly long. Uh, so we want to figure out how we can make that link sorter, shorter. Uh, the first thing you want to do is you need to buy a domain name. Uh, so if you want to buy, I don't know, like threemusketeers.com or something, you have to actually go to a website, domain name reg registrar. Uh, the biggest one I think is GoDaddy. Uh, you can just find your perfect domain name. So let's say threemusketeers.com. That's not how you spell that. Search it, that's probably gonna be a popular one. Yeah, it's gonna be taken, but you can also get your own like sort of domain name. You'll pay usually an annual fee in order to get one of these. Uh, but once you have them, you can use the other service I was referring to called Route 53 uh, in order to uh, use that with your S3 bucket. Uh, the only caveat is that your bucket actually has to have the same name as the URL that you want. Um, and I will show an example of that right now. So my current domain name is gamebot2.com, meaning I have access to gamebot2.com as well as any subdomains of gamebot2.com, meaning something.gamebot2.com. So if I wanted to create summer, if I wanted something to be available at summerhacks.gamebot2.com, I would need to make a bucket with that exact name. Uh, and we can simply just create the bucket like before. Uh, upload our file. Uh, I, I'm doing the exact same thing that I did earlier here. So I'm not gonna really explain, I'm just gonna go for it. Turned off public, turned off block public access here allow everyone to list objects here and did the cool stuff with the bucket policy. Uh, of course, we have a new bucket name now, so we will type in our new bucket name. Flash start. That should be good. Again, if you did everything correctly, then you should have, you should see three public tags, one for permissions, one for ACL and one for your bucket policy. Uh, so now we have a second bucket, which is exactly the same as our first bucket. Um, if we want, we can go ahead and test it by opening up this link and boom. So same thing. Uh, yeah, that is, that is our bucket. Um, and now let us go ahead and go to our other service. 
So the service is called Route 53. Again, it is the domain name registration service for uh, AWS. Uh, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to create a hosted zone for your domain name. Uh, this process is very easy. Really, it's just, you know, click the new hosted zone thing, answer all the questions it has, put in your domain name, and it'll make a hosted zone for you. Uh, so, for example, with my URL, gamebot2.com, I have made a hosted zone, and I can click into that. Don't be scared by all these records here. Um, this is all for my other websites and stuff. Uh, but all you need to do in order to link your own website, you will create a record set. Uh, and here it will ask you for the name of your record set, right? Which is the name of the website that you were trying to create. Now, if you remember, the bucket I created was, where did it go? Oh, did I close it? There it is. The bucket I created was summerhacks.gamebot2.com. So I will type summerhacks here so that the full URL becomes summerhacks.gamebot2.com. And this will be filled with whatever your specific URL is. Um, you will change alias to yes and perfect. Now you will be able to see the bucket under this S3 website endpoints section, if and only if the name exactly matches what you put up here um, and it has public access. So click on that. Uh, I believe that should be it. Yep, right here in alias record. All right, so there you can see the records that we've just created. It might take some time for it to update. So in the meantime, how's everyone's life going? Oh, just kidding. There it is. I don't want to hear how your life is going. Um, I'm just kidding. But yeah, here we go. So now you can see it's the exact same page we had earlier, uh, except now we have our specific link uh, under our own domain name. Uh, so summerhacks.gamebot2.com, and we have our own web page. Um, and now all you want to, all you need to do if you want to modify your web page uh, is simply go back to your Google Drive equivalent S3, find your bucket, and then change around what's in here. So if you want to include more HTML files, more CSS files, just change them around and it should automatically update this for you with your own unique link. Yeah, and that's about it. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with this. I mean, you can host personal portfolios. You can make websites for, you know, companies or something that you're starting or um, just other random stuff. Uh, but it, it is definitely a very important skill to have um, for anyone trying to get a little bit into web development. That is all that I have for you all today. So are there any questions? There aren't any as of now, but I'm monitoring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... We'll wait a few minutes just to account for the for the delay. If you're watching this, I hope your day is going great. How much more difficult is it to create a dynamic website? That is a good question. Uh, considerably. The, because uh, one huge advantage to this is that it's simple, but also that it's free. Uh, because really S3 is actually not meant to be used for website hosting. It's meant to be used for logging or other sort of like online storage, right? Um, so we're kind of using a sort of a hack in order to host a static website. Um, however, if we wanted to host a dynamic website, we'd have to go about the usual way of actually starting a server um, on an instance that either we have provided or that AWS has provided for us. Um, so if you're interested, I mean, the service that you would use for that is called EC2. Uh, basically, it's just asking Amazon for a computer, uh, you SSH into that one, and then you can start your own website from there. And you can do the same thing with Route 53, where you reroute your, uh, your name traffic in order to a certain EC2 instance instead of just an S3 instance. Um, so yeah, you can definitely do it with AWS. I mean, that's what it's there for. Uh, the problem is it, is it is considerably harder and it also will cost you considerably more. Yeah, uh, also one thing I didn't mention is that the cool thing about S3 uh, is that it will charge you uh, by the number of requests that are made for your objects. So S3 will only, I don't know the exact pricing, but it'll only charge you like four bucks for every million requests or something. So unless people are accessing your website a million times, you're not gonna have to pay very much at all. 
And lucky for me, nobody really cares that I exist. So my websites are not really that accessed. Um, it is what it is. We got a like on the stream. That's hype. Is it tacky to like your own stream? Probably not, right? Nope, do it. Can you purchase domain names in AWS rather than using a third party company like GoDaddy? Yes, you can. Um, I am actually not too sure about the specifics, specifics of this. Um, I believe that uh, only certain providers will own certain domain names, right? So if you want the more common probably domain names that people think about, you'll probably want to end up going to GoDaddy. Um, might be wrong on that. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I, I certainly recommend GoDaddy. And then there's only a tiny bit of like, you know, integrating with AWS. What if we use Docker and Kubernetes and get a work, working link? Is this possible? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're referring to uh, Route 53, right? The idea is that if you wanted to use Docker and Kubernetes on an AWS instance, and then reroute your domain name traffic to the instance, uh, which is running a website on Docker and Kubernetes, that would totally work. You could also, I mean, I guess you don't technically need to be an AWS instance or bucket either, right? You could just host it on your own public facing IP and then have the domain name, you know, reroute over to that. Uh, but yeah, it's certainly possible. I've definitely seen companies do it all the time for sure. Feel free to comment on the stream too. I got some good comments up here. What hardware specs would you need to host a website? Hardware specs? Yeah. Um, I don't think anything in particular, right? Um, it depends on the intensity of your website. Like uh, if you want to host a dynamic website, that's kind of like Amazon, you know, you can't just do that from your own personal laptop. Uh, but I had a friend, uh, some of the viewers probably know who this is, who hosted a website that was used by an entire school district from his own personal computer. Um, so, I mean, it, it, does, it certainly doesn't take that much work. I would imagine most PCs have the power to host a simple website. Probably just wait one more minute for any questions and then we'll go ahead and close the stream. As always, you're welcome to ask me any questions on Slack or in my email. If there's any means of contacting me, happy to talk more about this offline. I've always wanted to say that. Happy to talk more about this offline. Everything's online now, so technically. <laughs> <laughs> offline person to person, Anj, like face to face. Hmm. Now here's a question. Uh, Vincent asks, would AWS Lambda or other serverless infrastructure be suitable for hosting dynamic websites? Uh, to which the answer, I think, I think it's definitely yes, um, but that's certainly less common. Um, Lambda is great as a backend idea uh, because it doesn't, 
uh, the idea is sort of like, you know, you access a Lambda function only when you certainly need to, i.e. when somebody is trying to request some sort of data. Uh, but it might be a little difficult to do that with simply front end code, right? So in fact, one of the most common architectures I think in AWS specifically uh, is using uh, something else for front end, either EC2 or even S3, uh, and then using Lambda for a backend service as opposed to having a separate EC2 or Elastic Beanstalk instance. Um, so yeah, I, I certainly recommend it for backend. And then you would also, um, you'd also end up paying less just because of how Lambda operates. And for those of you that don't know, Lambda is a sort of serverless uh, computer thing, um, which doesn't mean that it doesn't use servers. Actually, it means that like, uh, it's not always running. You can basically tell it, okay, when somebody says or does something, then I want this code to execute. Um, and generally it'll charge you less because you don't have to have the entire server booked forever. So Sne asked, can we have our websites hosted using Kubernetes and Docker? Uh, yes, I believe I already answered this earlier, in fact. Um, yeah, you can. And you can also integrate Kubernetes and Docker with AWS instances. That's a very common architecture as well. I'd be lying if I said I knew exactly how to do it. I'm not familiar with um, exactly how to use those technologies, but I do know it happens. Probably stop sharing my screen. Okay, I think I think we can go ahead and call it. Um, if you have any questions, again, please feel free to Slack me, um, or even just comment on the YouTube video, and I will uh, will happily answer them when I get the chance. Uh, thank you all for attending. Please look forward to other summer hacks events, uh, and I hope to see you guys at our next few workshops and then our fun event on Friday as well. Uh, take care, everyone.